Hello, everyone, and welcome to Litigation Radio. I'm your host, Dave Scriven-Young, and I'm a commercial and environmental litigator in the Chicago office of Bakar & Abramson, which is recognized as the largest law firm serving the construction industry with 115 lawyers and 10 offices around the U.S. On this show, we talk to the country's top litigators and judges to discover best practices in developing our careers, winning cases, getting more clients, and building a sustainable practice. This podcast is brought to you by the litigation section of the American Bar Association. The litigation section provides litigators of all practice areas the resources we need to be successful advocates for our clients. Learn more at ambar.org litigation. In the midst of the global pandemic, litigators have been speaking with clients, taking depositions, and participating in hearings via remote platforms such as Zoom. In some areas of the country, courts have taken this one step further and allowed jury trials to be held via Zoom. My two guests, federal judges Marsha Peckman and Thomas Zilli, are the pioneers of this movement and will give practical advice on how to persuade a judge and jury in a remote environment. First, let me introduce Judge Peckman. The Honorable Marsha J. Peckman has served since 1999 as a judge of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington. Judge Peckman chairs the Western District of Washington's Remote Jury Trial Committee, which developed materials and processes necessary to conduct remote civil jury trials on the ZoomGov platform in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Judge Peckman received a BA from Cornell University and her JD from Boston University Law School. Prior to her appointment on the federal bench, she was a partner in a Seattle law firm, a King County prosecutor, a public defender while supervising the Criminal Law Defender Clinic at the University of Washington School of Law, and a King County Superior Court judge. Welcome to the show, Your Honor. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Now let me introduce Judge Zilli. The Honorable Thomas S. Zilli is also a judge of the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington, and prior to his appointment, Judge Zilli was a partner in a Seattle law firm where he practiced for over 25 years, serving as a member of the firm's executive committee and chair of the firm's commercial litigation section. Judge Zilli received his undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and saw active duty as an officer in the United States Naval Reserve. He attended Cornell University Law School. Judge Zilli is a past president of the King County Bar Association and during his years in practice was active in the Federal Bar Association of the Western District of Washington. Welcome to the show, Judge. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Dave. Well, let me start with Judge Peckman uh, to give us some background. So the Western District of Washington was the first federal district court to do a Zoom jury trial during the pandemic. Can you please give us some background on how that happened? Well, it really happened quite by chance. I happened to be the first judge in the district who did a bench trial. And our chief judge, Judge uh, Ricardo Martinez, asked me if I would be willing to expand that experience to exploring whether that was possible to do for civil jury trials. So what we did is we put together a team of employees throughout the uh, district we put together IT departments, educators for IT, law clerks, magistrate judge, jury administrator, and uh, we went to work. And the first thing we did is we surveyed about 600 jurors to see if people were willing to come into the courthouse during the time of the pandemic. And actually what we found is over 50% of those who were surveyed said, no, they were not. And so in addition to the health concerns that we had in keeping people safe, we also had a concern that our juries were going to be very, very diminished and that our participation was going to be diminished as well. This committee then worked extraordinarily hard. Um, the first thing we did is we tested platforms. We tested WebEx, we tested uh, Teams, we tested Zoom, and we decided that Zoom.gov was really going to be the best platform for us. We then took a trial and we broke down every single event that happens in a trial from the time that you send out a summons to our jurors to the return and signature on a verdict form. And we tried to replicate what that would look like if we were going to do it remotely. So based upon that information and that checklist, we then started to put together a template order that we could use to cover all the areas that we thought a judge and lawyers would need to know about in order to be prepared for a trial. So we put together an order that talked about where you go to get educated. We put together an order that covered protocols and uh, how to dress. 
how to introduce exhibits, as well as how to prepare your witnesses. We went through 13 drafts of that template. And then we decided that we had to have a real live test. And that's when Judge Zilly came into the picture because he had a case that we thought might make a perfect mock trial. And I'll let him tell you a little bit about that later, but it was a perfect trial to try out the process. And so we recruited friends actually, and we paid them to come in and act as jurors. And we put on a mock trial. And then we debriefed those jurors and worked with them to gather information about how we might do this process better. And out of that came two different handbooks, one for lawyers and one for internal staff and, and judges. We then sent those notebooks out to be, or handbooks, I should say, out to be beta tested. And we had lawyers go through the handbook go to every link, uh, try out every click, and give us feedback as to how we could redraft those handbooks to be appropriate. And then we launched. And Judge Zilly, using the same trial that we used for a mock trial, actually did it for real. Now, since that time, we've revised the handbook as we've learned more information. We've collected data from our juries. We've now tried nine jury trials in the Western District of Washington. And we have also put together our own seminar for the federal um, judiciary and staff. And I'm happy to tell you that we had huge participation. We had 1,022 logons to watch the seminar. So our staff has basically extended themselves nationally. Every district that has called on us for help, we have given it. Excellent. It sounds like an incredible amount of work went into went into this. Let me ask you a little bit about the the virtual platform that is used, the Zoom.gov. I'm curious uh, if either of you had a particular fear of using virtual platforms for jury trials, either because you were unfamiliar with the technology or because you didn't think a trial could be conducted over Zoom. Because I can tell you, I think I'm probably like most people, I had never really heard of Zoom before the pandemic started. So I wonder, Judge Zilli, if you could uh, tell us if you had any you know fear about using a virtual platform for jury trials? I can say that I didn't have as much fear as I would have today if I knew all the things that we had to go through and to get where we are today. But, you know, I had been using the Zoom platform for social contacts for many months. I was familiar with the Zoom technology. I wasn't familiar with Box.com that we can talk about where we put the exhibits during the trial, but that's something that we could learn. But I, one thing that you should, we all realize, of course, is that putting on a testimony, even in open court, often occurs via either perpetuation depositions or people testify live, but on the screen remotely. So we've been familiar with that process for a long time, even before the pandemic closed the court rooms. So that's all good. We've had wonderful support from our IT and uh, law clerks and courtroom deputies who have provided uh, great help and assistance to us. I felt that the Zoom platform would be an ideal way to proceed. Just to follow up a little bit on the mock trial, the judge Peckman is a very persuasive judge, and she called me and said, would I be willing to be the judge for this mock trial that was going to parrot the case that we had identified as perhaps the one to try first? The mock trial was a perfect vehicle to learn how to select a jury, to look at exhibits, to take testimony, to deliberate and reach a verdict. And we did all that. We picked a jury remotely in the mock trial. They heard argument, they, heard, they saw testimony, they saw uh, exhibits, and we essentially went through a trial, uh, much like lawyers frequently do before they trial a case in open court. They have mock juries that they present materials to and try and get a fix on how strong or weak their case is. So it was nothing new. I persuaded 
I would say gently, but I persuaded the lawyers who were going to be in the first case to be the actual lawyers on the mock trial. And that worked to, the, to their benefit as well, because they were familiar with the process when we got to the real trial. But we've learned a lot, and uh, I think it's a great program. Judge Zilli, you mentioned Box.com, and I'm curious how uh, the attorneys are are using Box.com to not only hold exhibits, but also perhaps display them during the trials. How, how does that work? Well, all the, all the exhibits uh, that are agreed to are downloaded to Box.com magically, and they can then use them by pulling up the exhibit, showing it, displaying it on the screen. When uh, the jury goes to deliver, so all of the exhibits that are then admitted are in the box.com. And when the jury deliberates, they have access to uh, pull up those exhibits. One of the interesting things in the box.com format is that during deliberations, jurors can look at any exhibits they want, and they can be looking at different exhibits. Normally, if they're in a jury room, they either have one hard copy of all of the exhibits or frequently electronically we have all of the exhibits available to them, but they can only look at one document at a time. So the box.com has given us the flexibility to allow the jurors during deliberations to look at any exhibit that they wish. Great. And, and Judge Peckman, same question to you in terms of, you know, fear of using a, a virtual platform. And I understand there were other platforms that were looked at by the district uh, court. And I wonder, you know, what, what advantages did Zoom have over those other platforms? Well, Judge Zilly is obviously much calmer than I was about the whole thing. I had not used Zoom before, and um, I, to be blunt, was terrified of doing uh, it remotely. My children laughed out loud when they heard that their mother was in charge of this committee because I have a hard time ordering a movie or um, I usually get three books of the same thing from Amazon if I try and order there. So my remote skills were nil. But as my uh, children reminded me, I was pretty good at bossing people around and I had great support to basically put together this committee. And it really is, I have to say that it's really not the judges who run this show, that it is the IT department. And they did a great deal of vetting at looking at platforms. We had worked with others where we could not sustain connectivity. They weren't as flexible in being able to move jurors in and out of virtual rooms. They didn't have a good chat feature, which we've taken advantage of. And so in our testing, we just found that this particular platform met the needs of actually being able to replicate a real trial. Well, let me ask about the first trial, Uh, Judge Zilli. As I understand it, the first Zoom jury trial resulted in a $1.35 million verdict for the plaintiff in a personal injury case against a cruise line. So I'm curious as to how this case was selected. Well, the case was set for trial uh, in... uh... September 2020. It involved a plaintiff who was an 86-year-old woman who had suffered a serious brain injury while on a cruise with Holland America. The injury occurred in 2018. The case was filed in 2019. We had a trial set. I was concerned because of her age, the seriousness of her injury, uh, the fact that She suffered both mental and emotional damages. She could not travel to Seattle. She lived in Southern California. So that if we were going to have a trial, she wasn't going to be present in any event because of the age and the the nature of the injury. Uh, You know, if we had not had a Zoom trial for this woman, she would be standing in line along with many other civil cases waiting to be tried. As it was, we tried the case in September. We got a verdict ultimately, and the verdict was not appealed. It was paid off in full. And she's had the benefit of her day in court in an expedited way, and uh, everything was perfect about that lawsuit. I would point out that not only was the plaintiff in Southern California, but most of the witnesses were out of state, 
and all of them would have had to travel to Seattle to testify. We heard liability experts who were including one witness who testified from a Holland America ship somewhere in the South Pacific. We heard from witnesses all over the world remotely. The damage experts, they were wonderful. One was the plaintiff's expert was a neurosurgeon from Southern California. He did the surgery. Uh, He testified for several hours uh, using the CT and CAT scans. And uh, he was a very persuasive witness. Uh, On the other hand, the defendants had a clinical professor from Stanford, again, a neurosurgeon in neuropathy and uh, neurosurgery. And she was an excellent witness as well. Now, these witnesses would never have been allowed or asked to travel to Seattle because of their time, because of the expense. So they were going to testify remotely under any circumstances. And that was true, essentially, of all the witnesses in the case. Many family members for the plaintiff lived in Southern California. The point is, if we hadn't tried it remotely, we would be waiting to try this case. And unfortunately, Uh, Like what has happened recently with the good ship stuck in the Suez Canal, there were lots of other vessels stuck behind who had to wait. And that's what's happened with our civil jury cases in this district and I think all over the country. They've not been tried. They're standing in line. They're waiting. And of course, because of the pandemic, the criminal cases have not been tried as well. And they're going to get first options to be tried because we need to get back in court and try them first. So this was an ideal case to be tried. It went well, I think, uh, from all respects. The lawyers were very pleased with the process. And although I think we've improved the process in later trials, this case was ideal for the uh, prototype, if you will. And following up on that, Judge, did you receive any pushback from either the attorneys or the parties when you perhaps approached them about doing a a, a Zoom civil jury trial? The parties on both sides pretty much agreed that they would pick the jury remotely, that they would allow the testimony remotely because the lawyers didn't want to travel. The witnesses didn't want to travel. Everybody was pleased with doing it remotely. What they said was, They weren't sure that they were comfortable having a jury deliberate remotely. And so what I said was, well, we'll consider that when we get into the trial, identify who the jurors are, and find out whether it would be possible to bring them back to remotely deliberate. As it turned out, it went smoothly. The jury did a nice job of listening to the evidence, and we then ultimately just had them deliberate remotely. Great. Well, let me turn to Judge Peckman. Um, I understand that the court is actually requiring Zoom trials to go forward in some instances, as opposed to looking for parties who would volunteer to do so. So just a blunt question, what is the legal authority to require parties to resolve their case via a Zoom trial? Well, that's one of the questions that all the judges around the country want to ask. Can you really make them do it? And one of the things that the committee did when we set up is we looked for authority. Where are we going to look to see if this is appropriate? And one of the things that I did is I had the Ninth Circuit uh, librarians basically do an extensive search. I truly consider them the bloodhounds of research. If there is a case out there, if there is an article, they will sniff it out. And what we found was there's absolutely nothing. There were a few futuristic articles about musing about the trial of the future, but there is nobody who said, no, you can't do this. And there was nobody who said, yes, you can. So I took the position and several of the judges in the Western District of Washington have since taken the position that what is not forbidden is allowed. And to wait for volunteers basically hands over the decision of uh, having justice go forward in the hands of a single party. I mean, it's no surprise that insurance companies want to hang on to their money for as long as possible. It's no surprise that plaintiffs want to move their cases forward. And so if you're waiting for volunteers, you're waiting, you're waiting for Godot. 
And so I took the position. I have now tried six remote trials, four jury, two bench. And I might be the only judge in America right now who has no backlog. Every case that was set in 2020 got tried in 2020. I have one case that will take the issue up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. And then perhaps we'll have some answers. But I've taken the view that as a judge, I have a responsibility for hundreds of litigants, not just one at a time. And honestly, nobody's come up with a better answer as to how we're going to move those hundreds of cases. Otherwise, Judge Zilli is absolutely right. Those ships are going to pile up like in the Suez Canal, and it'll take us years to dig out of the problem. Well, certainly there seems to be a lot of benefits to a Zoom jury trial, including, you know, the efficiencies that Judge Zilli talked about. Judge Beckman, you talked about getting rid of, of, of the backlog of cases. Judge Zilli, I wonder, you know, one of the fears of a Zoom jury trial is that the jury composition may not be similar to your normal jury pool because folks may not be familiar with or even have technology. They may not have, you know, quiet places in their houses. How does the court deal with those concerns? Let me, let me just add to what Judge Peckman was saying about the previous question. There are now several orders that have been entered in the Western District that are online for the lawyers to look at explaining the circumstances necessitating and authorizing virtual trials. And they can be found on Westlaw and provide uh, support for having these trials remotely. You start with Rule 43A, which requires good cause in compelling circumstances and under appropriate safeguards to conduct them. And we've analyzed that rule and the circumstances and concluded that these cases can be tried remotely uh, consistent with the federal rules. Now, in every instance, I have asked the lawyers to show cause why a remote trial cannot be had. And I examine their objections in these cases. And, you know, if there is a case that comes along that both sides say this is not one that can be done remotely and uh, give a lot of pushback, I, you know, it's a discretionary thing, I believe. I think ultimately we'll be affirmed on requiring it. But it's discretionary. And if both sides were in agreement that it should be delayed for whatever reason, I probably would buy into that. But what I've found is the lawyers' excuses are they're worried about whether the jurors would be attentive. They're worried whether we're going to have the same mix of jurors. Lots of things which we think we have cured. So I don't think that's a problem. Now, that's a lot of statements before I get to the question that you were wanting and whether, I guess, the jurors were the same mix and how that all worked. What we've done is we've created a Zoom platform survey that we send to the juries from the, we use the, the driver's license for the state of Washington. We're in the Western District of Washington, so all of Western Washington, although Judge Peckman and I sit in Seattle and we handle cases from the Pierce County line up to the Canadian border. But We sent them a Zoom platform survey, and we asked them whether you have any experience using the Zoom platform. Uh, Do you have access to a desk computer, a laptop, or some device with a video camera? Do you have reliable internet connectivity? Do you have the necessary equipment to participate? And would you come to the courthouse and learn if we were willing to give you an iPad to take home to participate? And do you have a place in your home where you can uh, be a juror and not be disturbed? So we get the answers and we find that most people have computers, are familiar with the Zoom technology, have connectivity, do have a space where they can participate, are willing to come to the courthouse to participate. And you know, of the two trials I've had, I've never had anyone who we subpoenaed who wanted to actually come to the courthouse and pick up a device. They have got the necessary equipment at home and were willing to go. I think the bottom line is that we have had a better response 
from jurors during this time who are willing to serve as jurors remotely because they're able to do it from the confines of their own personal space. They don't have to travel to the courthouse. The recent trial I had, I think there were five or six people from more than 100 miles away that would have had to come and stay in a hotel if we'd had it in person. So there are lots of reasons why this has worked well remotely for jurors. So Judge Zilli, do you believe that the composition of the jury pool is the same in terms of diversity, age, gender, that sort of thing? Yeah, we've, we've looked at that because we were concerned about that very thing. And we find that, uh, if anything, both the diversity uh, and the uh, response was better than even if we were having the jurors come to the courthouse. We're getting more response, more people willing to serve as jurors under these circumstances than we would normally have if you were back in the courthouse asking them to come to Seattle, to the courthouse, and participate in that manner. So I think we're getting a better selection. And uh, frankly, the mix and the education which we look at and all of the criteria for the jury matches very similar to what we had before. Well, continuing on with the questions about jurors, Judge Peckman, there was a Law 360 article interviewing one of the jurors from the court's first Zoom patent trial, where a $4 million verdict was rendered in favor of the plaintiff. It seemed like the jury was generally pleased with the process and the platforms used, and I understand that the court requests feedback from jurors in these Zoom trials. What kind of feedback are you getting from jurors? Well, actually, the district is now done, um, is concluding its ninth trial today, and we have done uh, debriefings with all of the jurors and asked them questions about their experience. And it seems that uniformly, they have been very delighted with the process, that they've uh, reported that they felt that they were able to pay attention. They felt that they were able to evaluate the witnesses that were in front of them. Some of them made comparisons between the times when they had served in live juries versus the Zoom and said that they felt that they were able to see and observe better because they had the witnesses face directly in front of them rather than seeing them 25, 30 feet away in our big federal court courtrooms. The other thing is, of course, even if we were to bring the jurors in, they're going to be masked up as well as uh, we're going to have plexiglass and face shields on our witnesses. So I have to say that in my own experience, that it was a little shocking to me, the first uh, trial that I did that you know, for 32 years, I've been trying to evaluate witnesses by looking at the side of their head. And for the first time, I actually could see their eyes and watch them as they testify. Uh, Judge Zilli is correct. We have had better response to our subpoenas. And also of the nine trials that we have where we have we've made the decision that we would loan out our equipment and educate people how to use it, We've only had one person come in and actually use the court's equipment. We have mailed some equipment and overnighted it to a juror I had where we had a windstorm and it knocked out their connectivity. We sent them an iPad to increase their connectivity and, you know, we, we pushed on. Also, when you think about it, we're using jurors' time five hours a day as opposed to eight, nine, sometimes 10 hours, because they're not coming driving into the courthouse. Uh, Some of the jurors from in our state drive for 160 miles to get to the courthouse. They're not having to put them, we're not having to put them up overnight in hotels when they come from long distances. They are able to be home when their kids are done with school. And so it has opened up a whole new realm of people who are willing to say yes, I will serve. 
Interesting. And just following up on the juror sort of feedback and how they were able to observe the witnesses, uh, Judge Zilley, I believe you presided over that patent trial that the Law 360 article was talking about. And one of the jurors suggested, and perhaps one of the only criticisms that I saw in the article, was that there is much less body language over Zoom than in person. And that makes me think that perhaps the juror lost some ability to judge the witness's credibility in a Zoom environment. And I wonder if you believe if that's true, but also, you know, what the court has done to improve uh, the experience for jurors. Well, the juror, that was my case, and that juror was uh, interviewed. Uh, We interviewed them, and then uh, he was interviewed uh, separately. Uh, But what he said was uh, he had been a juror in a civil case for 10 weeks before in court, and he said the experience he had in this patent case was almost in all respects better. He could see the documents, the exhibits, and the witnesses' face on Zoom better than in the courtroom. He could hear everything better. He did say that uh, one of the the only downside he reported was that occasionally uh, you're kind of required as a juror to kind of face the camera and be attentive all the time. In the courthouse, you might be distracted if someone comes in in the rear of the courtroom. So there's a little movement there. And that in that context, he said, in the courtroom, he said, you can usually look around the room and out the windows. And then he said, and there's much less body language over Zoom. But I have to tell you, as a judge, when you're in speaker view, as the witnesses are testifying and the lawyers are arguing, you're front and center in front of your audience. And your body language and the witnesses' body language is much more in play, if you will, in that context. I think it's a much better platform, frankly, than having the lawyer in the argument stand, you know, 20 or 30 feet from the jury as we require. They stand by the podium and the witnesses are going to be 30 or 40 feet away and they're going to be having these uh, masks and they're going to have plexiglass and we're we're just not going to have the same ability in open court to provide the same type of experience for the juror at the present time. Well, let's talk tactics. The lawyers listening to this podcast are really interested in impressing both judges and juries over Zoom and want to get better. They want to do a great job for their their clients. Judge Peckman, I wonder if you can give us some examples of things that attorneys have done in your virtual courtroom that have worked and perhaps not worked so well. I guess the first thing that I would say is that it requires a slightly different uh, skill set. And uh, the medium uh, has become the message. If courtroom trials are like theater, Zoom trials are like television. And you have the opportunity as a lawyer to really control the space. So the first thing I would say is that Zoom trials are going to require practice that you have to be able to get familiar with the platform. You have to be familiar with the space that you are presenting. You have to get familiar with making sure that your witnesses are in an acceptable space to be paid attention to. But some of the real advantages are, and I tried a um, police misconduct case that had extraordinary animation, charts, maps, aerial photographs. There were 23 police cars involved in a chase, and we were able to do an aerial reproduction of where those uh, officers were with their cars at any given moment. So it opened up some of the ability to be expressive with your exhibits that we wouldn't have in the courtroom. I'd point out, too, that our jurors are looking at it on their own equipment. So when they want to take a look at it at an exhibit, they can alter the size of the font if they wish. They can alter the brightness behind their screen. You can call out certain sentences for them to be able to read and they have it directly in front of them, and they have the ability to call that out during their deliberations. So first thing, practice. 
Second, take a look at the settings that you are in. Watch your lighting. Make sure that your bald head isn't what's uh, predominant on the screen. Make sure your voice can be heard. It requires, just like you were shooting a movie, to take some care to make sure that all of those technical things are in place. The other thing I'm going to tell you is that there's a certain amount of decorum that I think judges should require, and it's part of our handbooks. Dress like you were in court. Forget the pajama bottoms. They don't make you feel like you're a professional. Stand up. And while you speak, if that means that you need to build a desk that goes up and down, so be it. Don't be sitting in your, in your desk chair, uh, slouching and eating a donut at the table. Think about yourself as in a polished performance. And those are the tips that I would give. Great. Thank you for that. And Judge Zilli, do you have any other tips for lawyers who will be doing a Zoom jury trial? Judge Peckman has covered many of them, but I think being professionally dressed and have a good background for your presentation, you can have a virtual background, carefully select it so that it's not distracting, but it's professional and indicates uh, the appropriate decorum. I think you need to practice before the camera as well, because in a recent case, I had the lawyer's closing argument, he was looking off to the side because his monitor and his, what he was reading from essentially was over to the side. So he was not, it was distracting because he wasn't looking at the camera. So you, it's a little different presentation. You need to practice that. I just think with using Zoom, you need to practice both uh, how you use your exhibits, how you present your case, how you make your arguments. I would also say that maybe the most important thing lawyers can do getting ready for Zoom trials is to take care of, feed well, and pay well your IT and your clerks and your support staff, because really, they're the ones that move the witnesses in and out of the waiting room and into the jury room and do all the things that make it look so seamless to us as judges sitting there watching the show. Well, let, let me follow up on something that Judge Peckman said about decorum. And I actually had a question about civility. So I recently participated in a settlement conference with a magistrate judge. And, you know, the lawyers were talking over each other, arguing with each other, talking over the judge. And the judge had just wanted to get an idea of what the case was about. So I wonder if, if you have seen any of this, Judge Peckman, and, and what your impression is of whether attorneys are maintaining civility over Zoom. Well, the description of your experience tells me that the judge lost control. And I have to say that I really haven't seen incivility in the cases that I've tried. But I do think that there are certain responsibilities that judges have in the uh, Zoom setting, and that is to basically set down what the ground rules are. So I haven't seen a difference between what kind of interventions I've had to make in the courtroom as opposed to Zoom. I will tell you that being a federal judge is infinitely easier to control parties than being a state court judge. Everything about our architecture, the dynamics of the courtroom, the formality makes that usually very easy. And of course, Zoom strips that away. I think that's the judge's responsibility to outline what the rules are. I haven't seen that to be a problem. Judge Lee, have you do you have any other thoughts about maintaining civility over Zoom? Well, I certainly agree with Judge Peckman. I, you know, we've been blessed uh, with great civility in the courts here in the Western District of Washington. I've seen no difference in the Zoom trial. If anything, the lawyers seem more willing to help the other side with the technology and the presentation of the exhibits. And you know, that happens in the if we're in the courtroom as well, frequently one side or the other is handling the exhibits for both sides in terms of presenting them, I see no difference at all. I, I certainly agree uh, civility is something that is controlled by the judge. If the judge doesn't have the ability or does, uh, loses control, then 
uh, not a lot of a business is going to be accomplished. So we, we've got between us over 60 years of trial experience. And I think lawyers would probably recognize that everyone has to be civil in our courtrooms. Well, Judge Zilli, let me follow up on something uh, that you and both you and Judge Peckman talked about, which is treating support staff well, especially IT. One of the things that I think people forget about are the court reporters. They're the ones that are taking down the record, and it must be very difficult to do that in a Zoom environment. So I wonder, Judge Zilli, if you have any tips for lawyers on how they can do better and make court reporters' jobs easier over Zoom. Well, I, yes, I, the court reporters, I think, have done well. Uh, they're not on the screen, so the lawyers can't see the court reporter. Just for bandwidth purposes, we try and have it that way. But the court reporters would benefit by the lawyers identifying themselves when they speak, even though they may have it on speaker view with different lawyers saying different things. It would be helpful to identify themselves. Uh, you know, we had one court reporter who lost connectivity and had to call us back and tell us that she was no longer taking uh, the transcript. But we got her, we found her and got her back within about five minutes. Uh, You know, we've lost jurors. I think the same problems occur with the court reporters. But I think uh, basically uh, the court reporters, like the jurors, are more relaxed in their home setting. You know, they have not had to commute to work. They can walk down the hall and get coffee during the break. They're very happy being in their home setting and uh, reporting. And I think uh, the transcripts uh, have indicated that uh, there's no difference in the quality of what of the work they do. That's great to hear. Judge Peckman, we've talked a lot about sort of the myths that attorneys and parties have concerning Zoom jury trials. Are there any other common myths that you've heard about jury trials and why are they not true? Well, probably one of the myths that I hear the most is that how do you know that they're paying attention? Well, one of the things that we wrote into our best practices is we have two court personnel whose job it is, is to watch the jury and alert the judge if there is a problem. But the point is that in a live jury trial in the courthouse, they could be daydreaming and you would never know it. The other thing is, how do you, how do you make sure that they're not looking things up or they're not getting outside information? And the answer to that is the same as if you were in a real courtroom, is that, of course, jurors can cheat and look things up, but it's a matter of trust. And it is, again, incumbent upon the judge to explain why those things are so important. You can't tell if somebody is cheating, if they're sitting uh, six feet away from you, if they are going to go look something up over the noon hour. As the mother of a teenager who was able to text in her pocket while sitting at the dinner table, you know, you, you can always hide it, but these are people who are interested in participating. Another way that um, we've been able to check on their ability to track is I allow jurors to ask questions after the lawyers are done with each witness. They ask insightful questions that show that they are understanding what is going on. And Zoom presented another chat feature. The chat feature was very helpful because they could write out their questions. I could instantly put them in the virtual jury room, review the questions with the lawyers, with a click, bring them back, and I would ask the questions of the witness. That was another check to show that they were paying attention. There's another myth that Zoom is gonna favor plaintiffs. Well, that's absolutely, there's no data on that whatsoever. We haven't statistically had enough cases to know whether that's the case. We've also had some defense verdicts. We've had cases settled in the middle. And of course, you're never going to know if a case is won or lost because a judge never knows what kind of money was left on the table. You could have a $2 million verdict, but if the offer was four, you lost the case. So when I hear lawyers make those kinds of pronouncements, they seem really quite foolish to me. 
because there's no data on it whatsoever. Well, let me ask perhaps the toughest question of the podcast for Judge Zill. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and answer whether you expect that Zoom trials and hearings will continue with us into the future, even after the pandemic is over. Well, Dave, that's a really tough question. But the answer is easy. Yes, I expect to use and, and offer Zoom technology and hearings and trials into the future, even when lawyers can come back into the courtroom. Remember, litigation is really expensive. Witnesses have to travel. They, jurors have to travel. Lawyers have to travel. And there's a lot of cost savings to everyone if we can do it remotely. And more and more, we're finding in our practice here, lawyers are from out of state and uh, witnesses are from all over the world. And many times they testify remotely, even if we're in court. And uh, I think that this technology, we've made it work so well that I think it should be available even when the courthouse opens in order to uh, further and give all the litigants uh, the best opportunity to resolve their cases. And, you know, I would say that there are several orders that we've entered now explaining why we were going to require a Zoom trial when there was some pushback. And frequently what happens, of course, is that once that order is entered, for whatever reason, the parties decide or know they're going to have to go to trial. And what do they do? They settle. And of course, most civil cases settle anyway. And if uh, these Zoom trials were not allowed, uh, we would just be piling them up. And I think that's what's happened in many courts around the country, unfortunately. And we're going to have a terrible backlog that they're going to have to work through. Well, I think we're just about at the end of our time together. I wonder, Judge Peckman, if you had any final words for our listeners in terms of, you know, if attorneys are a little scared of doing their first Zoom trial, if you can give some words of encouragement to them and anything else you'd like to say to our audience. I want to go back and reiterate something that Judge Zilly said, and that is uh, for years we have been lamenting the vanishing federal jury trial. And although there isn't any platform that is perfect, I think that we will begin to pick and choose and create what I'll call the individualized trial because we can take the best of what we've found and combine it with those things that we want to sustain. And cost is one of the extraordinary issues, both for the court and for the litigants. Convenience is another extraordinary issue that is of importance. And finally, participation, that the American people really do want to participate in their government. This is a way that we can expand participation and show the American citizen that they have an institution that is creative and that is functioning. And we should be lucky that we have citizens who are willing to invite us into their homes to participate. As for innovation, I thought frequently about our founding fathers and I'm betting somebody like Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson would absolutely be astonished and delighted to see the innovation because, of course, they were great innovators, too. Great words, uh, Judge Peckman. Thank you. Um, and Judge Zilly, do you have any uh, final words for our audience? Well, it's hard to, hard to compete with that, Dave, but I would just say that remote jury trials and hearings, I think, can produce the same results. There are many advantages to the litigants. They work well. I would just encourage your audience to look at the materials that are out there. We've got a handbook that explains just exactly what needs to be done in a Zoom trial practice. But I think uh, you should, uh, I, I would hope all lawyers would uh, be willing to uh, advance in this way because I do think it promotes the justice system in our country in these times and even into the future. 
Well, Judges Peckman and Zilly, it's been a real pleasure having you both as my guest. Thank you so much for being on the show today. And thank you for your service to the profession and to the American people for doing what I know is a very difficult job. Now it's time for our quick tip from the ABA litigation section. So let's welcome Daryl Wilson to the show. Daryl is an in-house litigator managing global litigation and investigations at Tyson Foods, Inc. in Springdale, Arkansas, where he focuses on COVID-19, antitrust, and e-discovery matters. Welcome to the show, Daryl. I understand you have a tip about opening statements. Dave, thank you for having me today. Sure, yes. So what I wanted to do is offer, I guess, about five tips for young lawyers and even all the lawyers about opening statements. What we have is I pulled this article from the American Bar Association that was written by Ferris Champagne. Ferris is a lawyer at the Women's Law Center of Maryland. And what we have is during trial, as you know, you'll open up your case in chief with your opening statements. And so not often do lawyers get an opportunity to go to court these days. But uh, if you do find yourself in court, what I want to do is offer probably five tips about what will be a great opening statement. As you know, for that opening statement, you're actually talking to the jury. So what you want to do is in your opening statements, one, your first tip is that you want to develop a theme. Your theme will kind of be what helps the jury follow along with what you're saying. And it keeps things kind of memorable because, again, you're going to be wanting the jury to make a decision at the end of the trial. And so you want to make sure that that jury is following along with you. So in that tip, you also just want to make sure that it flows. And that gets us to our second tip is that you want to make sure that your theme tells a story. Oftentimes we know that we have jurors that are sitting around and sometimes they've been there all day or, or, or just kind of in the deliberation or even in your voir dire. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you keep your jury engaged by telling a story. If they have a story to follow along with, it allows them to kind of keep them on the edge of their seats to see what's next and what's going to happen. So the more compelling your story is, the more likely that you will be able to keep that juror engaged and make sure they don't fall asleep while you're trying to provide your opening statement. Which takes me to my next tip for you. You want to make sure that you assemble the facts. As a lawyer, you want to make sure that you have practiced that opening statement and that you've gotten your facts kind of memorized in your head to make sure that you can tell that story properly and the best way to make the juror kind of side with you and hopefully rule in your favor at the end of the trial. As you assemble the facts, you just want to make sure that you put them in order and that you do not ramble on and on and on and on and on about some of the minute facts that may not matter. You want to make sure that you get your most important facts before the jury so that they can understand your case in chief. Now, speaking of facts, you oftentimes will have cases where you may have bad facts and as a young lawyer, sometimes you want to make sure that you win your case and maybe your first case, but sometimes your first case may have those bad facts. So the best thing to do in that instance, uh, for my opinion, is to actually go ahead and put the bad facts out there on the table. That way you can kind of establish a rapport with your jury, because at that point they see that there are some bad facts there and that you weren't afraid and that you weren't trying to hide something from them. So what you want to do is you want to go ahead and put those bad facts out on the table and then find ways that will help you in your case in chief to develop why those facts may not be as bad and things that may help you obviously prevail at the end of the trial. So one thing that I would say that probably takes me to really what may be my last tip about opening statements would be is that you want to make the connection. Oftentimes, juries will rule in favor of people who they like. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you're attentive during your voir dire period. You want to make sure that you just kind of watch what jurors do, see how they react to certain questions. And as you get ready to do your opening statements, see how they react to some of your facts and some of the things that you say. So while you're there to really focus on the trial and to focus on your case in chief, you also want to make sure that you're following along with your jury and see how they interact. You may want to make things a little bit more personal. You may want to look at some of the jurors in the eyes and maybe offer some advice or things that may be in your opening statement that may appeal to them. So you want to actually treat them like they are a person and that they're not just there as a as a human body filling a seat for your trial, because ultimately they will be making the decision of the outcome of your case. So you want to be able to connect with them and make sure that the jury likes you and that you're a likable person. So you don't want to be rude or anything or, or kind of be distasteful in your opening statement. You want to make sure that you have that connection with the jury. 
overall, the last thing that I'll provide is that in your opening statement, you want to make sure that the jury knows exactly what you're praying for and what you're asking them to do. You want them to know how you want them to rule in the case. So what you want to do is provide an outline for them and provide that prayer to them to make sure that they know exactly what you're seeking and what you're asking on behalf of your client. And that, my friends, is the best way to provide a winning and compelling opening statement. Awesome. Well, great tips, Daryl. Thank you for being on the show today. And my prayer is that you come back next time uh, to join us to give us some more tips. So really appreciate it. Absolutely. So that's our show for today. A ton of time and energy for many volunteers goes into making these shows. So I want to show my appreciation. Thank you to Ian Mensher, Catherine Kim, Dan Oates, and Seth Rao, especially on this show for helping me with guest preparation and booking. This show is produced fabulously by Rich Rivera. Thanks so much, Rich. My gratitude also goes out to the co-chairs of the litigation section's audio content committee, Josh Jones and Tyler True, as well as Michelle Oberts, who is on staff at the section. Michelle, you have the patience of a saint. Thank you to Lawrence Coletti and our audio professionals from Legal Talk Network. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time. <laughs>